Chapter Thirteen of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Africa by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Egypt: A Trip Through the Country. We have landed at Alexandria and are making our way through the Nile Valley. How delightful it is, and how refreshing after our long travels in the thirsty Sahara! The land is alive with luxuriant green, the gold of ripening grain and the warm black earth freshly turned by the plough the fields are enclosed by little mud walls and the crops are spread out before our eyes in a many-coloured patchwork through which run roads paths and silvery canals that field of snow in the distance is egyptian cotton in which crop the country competes with our southern states the green expanse at the left is clover which grows here as luxuriantly as anywhere in the world and farther on are corn and sugar cane rising and falling under the wind from the desert we ride through pasture fields where thousands of animals each tied to a stake or watched over by a herdsman are feeding there are camels donkeys and water buffaloes there are flocks of fat sheep and goats and here and there a horse or mule how busy every one is little caravans are going to and fro over the roads here comes a drove of donkeys each so hidden by the bundle of grass upon him that we can see only his ears as he moves along without halter bridle or saddle behind is a line of camels each loaded with two bales slung from its hump while farther back are other camels piled high with grain we stop now and then talk with the farmers they are of the peasant class known as fellahs forming about two-thirds of the whole population they are the descendants of the ancient egyptians mixed with the various races which have conquered the country many of them own their farms little patches often no larger than our village gardens others work as farm hands on the estates of rich landowners scattered over the country they are generally poor wages are low and they earn but a few cents a day the people live in villages and go out to their farms the cattle feed out of doors all the year round and are often taken into the house with the family at night the villages are sometimes shaded by date palms but often have no trees whatever there are no yards or gardens the houses are of sun-dried brick with roofs of straw or palm leaves most of them are of one story and few have more than two small rooms near the roof are little square holes which admit the air serving as windows the average roof is so low that we can reach it as we sit on our donkeys the furniture of one of these houses consists of little more than a few mats a copper kettle and some earthenware pots the bed is a ledge built in the side of the room fires are not needed for heating and the cooking is usually done out of doors on little stoves of burnt clay the ordinary food is a coarse bread of corn wheat or millet made up in round flat cakes the fellahs eat vegetables eggs cheese and dates but they seldom have meat they sit around on the ground at their meals they have no forks and every one eats with his fingers the egyptians dress simply a man is well clad if he has a pair of short trousers and a gown of blue cotton with a felt cap for his head sometimes he twists a scarf about his cap making it look like a turban and on dress occasions he may have a pair of shoes of bright colored leather the women wear blue cotton gowns much the same as the men but most of them have cloths over their heads and long black veils covering their faces so that only the eyes can be seen they are straight from the custom of carrying things on their heads we see many children sprawling about in the dust near the huts some are making mud pies on the banks of the canals and some herding the donkeys and sheep driving the animals to and from pasture the smaller children are half naked and the babies wear no clothes at all their mothers carry them about astride their shoulders instead of in the arms as we do now we have left the village and are again in the fields here two men are hoeing there one is ploughing with a camel and donkey hitched up together and farther on is another driving two oxen in front of a harrow down the road comes a boy on a buffalo he has neither bridle nor saddle and sits woman fashion the little fellow wears no clothes and his skin is tanned black by the sun buffaloes are used here for all sorts of farm work and they also furnish milk and meat for the fellahs 
notice the two men standing knee-deep in that canal with a basket work bucket hung by a rope between them they are scooping the water from the canal into the bucket and with a swinging motion are throwing it into another canal higher up so that it runs off over the fields that is one mode of irrigation which prevails all over egypt tens of thousands of men and boys are always lifting up water in that way from the river or the canals so that it can be spread over the crops the little mud walls about the fields hold in the water there are many other methods of irrigation and among them the great wheel with jars attached to its rim such as we saw in morocco the wheels move about in the wells or canals and as they turn raise the water and pour it into troughs through which it flows over the country a blindfolded donkey or buffalo keeps the wheel moving and a boy or girl runs along behind to whip the animal whenever he stops there are more than fifty thousand such wheels in lower egypt requiring about twice that number of buffaloes and donkeys to keep them in motion some soils need only the floods to make them fertile and others are irrigated throughout the year the climate grows warmer as we go up the river and the difference affects the seasons of seed time and harvest as a usual thing three crops are grown the winter crop is of grains of all kinds this is sown in november and harvested in may or june the summer crop is sown in march april and may when the nile is low and harvested in october and november it is made up of cotton sugar and rice the autumn crop which is sown in july and gathered in september and october consists of rice indian corn millet and vegetables in the delta vast quantities of cotton are produced as well as rice wheat and indian corn cotton is the most valuable crop bringing in many millions of dollars a year the egyptian cotton has a fiber which is very desirable for certain kinds of cloth and much of it is imported by our manufacturers sugar cane grows well in middle and upper egypt as do also the various grains and vegetables the soil is everywhere fertile and if it has the rich mud from the nile it produces abundantly sometimes the seed is scattered on the mud after the flood and tramped in by oxen or goats most of the year the sun is so warm that the crops ripen quickly End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b alexandria and cairo egypt is one of the oldest countries of the world the nile valley is so rich and the river running through it to the sea so wide and deep that its people soon began to trade with other nations they became wealthy and civilized they had great cities when europe was still inhabited by savages and in early ages were so noted for their learning that strangers from everywhere came here to study from writings engraved on the old monuments we know that this valley had kings several thousand years before christ was born the bible tells us how jacob went down into egypt and how his son joseph became the prime minister of pharaoh one of the kings of that time the bible also describes how the israelites were afterward enslaved by the egyptians and made to toil under taskmasters until the plagues came and the king told moses he might lead his people out of the country we are now in alexandria on the mediterranean sea at one of the mouths of the nile just where it is easiest to ship goods from and to all parts of the valley the city was named for alexander the great who founded it about three hundred thirty two b c after he had conquered the egyptians it grew rapidly and became the most magnificent city of its time until the route around the cape of good hope was discovered it was about the only doorway to africa and consequently a great centre of commerce and trade alexandria was long a seat of learning some of the most famous geographers astronomers and mathematicians of antiquity lived here and when egypt was conquered by the arabs about six hundred forty one a d it had the greatest library of the world the arab general ordered that the library be destroyed he said the koran contained everything that a man ought to know 
and therefore other books were not needed he gave the books to the public bathhouses to feed their fires and there were so many that it took months to consume them at that time alexandria had four thousand palaces four hundred places of amusement twelve thousand gardens and four hundred public baths after that the people were converted to the mohammedan religion and nine-tenths of all the egyptians are now of that faith in the sixteenth century the arabs were conquered by the turks and the country is now a dependency of the sultan of turkey being ruled by a governor called the khedive in times past the egyptians have been terribly oppressed they have been forced to work for the government without pay and have been treated quite as harshly by their masters as the israelites were treated by the egyptian kings in the days of moses of late years however the country has been so in debt to great britain that the british have practically taken charge of it directing the khedive how to rule this is a good thing for egypt the british see that good order is kept the peasants are not oppressed taxes have been reduced and railroads have been built far up the nile valley so that we can travel through most of the country by rail we spend but a few days in alexandria it is the chief city on the african coast and is still noted for its commerce although its scholarly traits have long since passed away it has one of the best harbors on the mediterranean and more than twenty steamship lines connect it with europe and other parts of the world the streets are wide and well paved with tramways running through them the business blocks are like those of europe and there are many fine foreign buildings in addition to the box-like houses of the natives we stroll about the wharves watching the loading of cotton sugar grain elephants tusks ostrich feathers and other merchandise brought up the nile valley from central africa we then take a donkey ride out over the ground where the great library stood to look at pompey's pillar a huge column of granite which was erected as a monument centuries ago a few hours by train brings us from alexandria to cairo the capital of egypt the largest city of africa and one of the most interesting cities of the world it lies on the right bank of the nile so situated that it is often spoken of as a beautiful jewel joining the handle to the green fan of the delta there was a city here many hundred years before christ and the present cairo was founded by the arabs shortly after they conquered egypt it was made the capital of egypt centuries ago and it is to-day next to constantinople the chief mohammedan city of the world the distance between alexandria and cairo is about one hundred miles the delta is level and rich crops stretch out on each side of the track as far as our eyes can reach now we are close to the nile and now far out from it winding our way through pastures dotted with cattle donkeys and camels and by the mud villages which are scattered over the plains at every stop crowds of queerly clad people rush to the car windows with refreshments to sell there are barefooted girls and boys in blue gowns there are women with their faces half covered carrying clay jars of water on their heads and peddlers wearing red fez caps who bring us hard-boiled eggs oranges dates bread and green sugar cane we bargain with them for some fruit and eat it on the train as we near cairo we can see the desert stretching away on both sides the minarets of the mosques are visible long before we come into the city and not far from the nile on the edge of the desert are the pyramids those great masses of stone which were erected as tombs by the egyptian kings of the past at the station we send our baggage on to the hotel and take donkeys for a ride through the city each of us has a long-eared shaggy-haired animal with a high red saddle and a donkey boy trotting behind the boys are brown-skinned little fellows in bare feet they wear skull-caps and have what look like nightgowns of blue cotton stretching from their necks to their ankles they speak a little english telling us the names of their donkeys one says my donkey good donkey him name uncle sam and another my donkey best donkey him name yankee doodle they see we are americans and think these names will please us each boy carries a rod with which he pokes the donkey or whips it to make it go faster the little beasts almost throw us off as they jerk their hind legs from one side to the other to escape the rod 
we direct the boys to take us to the foreign part of the city we wish to see the palaces of the khedive and his officials and the wide boulevards and beautiful parks for which the city is noted we then look at the houses of the wealthy greeks and egyptians and later dine at one of the hotels built for the many people who come here from europe and america to spend the winter on account of the excellent climate after dinner we rest a while on the hotel porch watching the turbaned long-gowned jugglers perform their magical tricks and the snake charmers make their poisonous snakes move to and fro to the music of pipes ragged musicians play for us and the strange characters of cairo pass up and down the street before our eyes there are business men and travellers in european clothes there are soldiers on horseback turbaned sheiks on donkeys and bedouins on camels there are officials in carriages with footmen running in front carrying the wands of authority to make the people get out of the way here goes an automobile there is a boy on a bicycle and behind comes a woman driving a donkey load of hens and geese the fowls are in crates and they crane their necks out of the slats down the street comes a boy with a cow which he milks from door to door he has a stuffed calf in his arms and sets this beside the cow when he milks her he says the cow will let down her milk if any kind of a calf is near by now our donkey boys are ready and we start on our trip through old cairo galloping in and out through the crowd to the oriental section of the city the houses are like those of the native parts of the african towns we have seen they are flat roofed and box shaped many have windows of lattice work extending out over the street and the doors are wonderfully carved most of the buildings are white and nearly all have dark-skinned egyptians standing outside or peeping out through the slats of the windows the streets are narrow and dirty and more thronged than those of other parts of the city and then the noise and the people we thought it strange in algiers and tunis but cairo is the strangest of all we are moving along through a kaleidoscope of many colors and costumes crowded and jostled by people on foot and by horses donkeys and camels we are pushed to the wall again and again by the porters who carry great boxes and bales on their backs held there by ropes tied around their foreheads our guide yells to those in front to get out of the road and warns us to be careful we go by girls carrying water on their heads in great earthen jars so carefully balanced that it does not spill as they walk along through the crowd blind beggars are picking their way with canes and peddlers are crying their wares some have trays of fruit on their heads and some jars of lemonade on their backs the water carriers ask us to drink from their goatskins and we are besieged everywhere by the beggars bakshish 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 a gift they cry not only in cairo but all over egypt from now on we shall find men women and children begging wherever we go the children running beside our donkeys for blocks with their little brown hands outstretched for alms we see richly dressed men wearing turbans and gowns and now and then finely clad ladies with veiled faces going along with black men servants to guard them we spend much time in the bazaars above the streets there is matting which shuts out the sun making a city of stores under one roof every variety of merchandise has its own place and work of all sorts goes on in the shops where the merchants are selling here boys and men in red fez caps and long gowns are making cups and trays they sit at low tables on which are sheets of brass which they pound into shape in the bazaar of the carvers boys squat on the floor and hold the wood with their toes as they cut it and in the street of the booksellers men sit cross-legged and bind curious volumes we walk through streets where only persian goods are sold and pass on to the indian bazaar where most of the dealers are hindus there are also turkish bazaars noted for their fine rugs bazaars selling watches and jewelry and others where one can buy sweetmeats perfumery and spices every now and then we get down from our donkeys to talk with the turbaned long gowned merchants they treat us politely asking us to sit on the ledge outside their stores and to have a cup of coffee with them while discussing the prices everything is sold by bargaining and they always ask more at first than they expect to get the time passes quickly and we go to the hotel for our meals 
returning to the native quarter again and again we visit the mosques for which cairo is noted some of them cover acres their huge buildings rising high above the rest of the city every mosque has a court in it with a fountain where the people wash their feet and hands before going in and each has its minaret on which the priest stands at certain hours of the day and night and calls the people to prayers we take off our shoes or put slippers over them before entering the mosques the mohammedans tell us we may if we wish keep our hats on one day is spent at the university of cairo the largest of all mohammedan schools here egyptian boys and men study the koran as we saw the moorish boys doing at fez the school is held in a mosque and the scholars are of all ages from little boys of four to grey-bearded men of seventy they are sitting on the floor in groups all in their bare feet or stocking feet their shoes having been left outside the mosque some of the children are learning to write the arabic characters some are committing sentences from the koran and they sway back and forth as they sing out the words one of the first sentences they learn is there is no god but god and mohammed is his prophet school is held here all the year round there are but few holidays and no long vacations the children begin when the sun rises first saying their prayers and then studying until noon later we visit some of the coptic churches the copts are descendants of the ancient egyptians and have a rude form of christianity there are several hundred thousand of them in egypt they dwell chiefly in the cities dressing and living like the mohammedans they are usually clerks or scribes we can tell them by their black turbans and caftans or vests the copts have a language of their own in upper egypt they own most of the land we shall see people who believe in the same religion in abyssinia farther on in our travels End of chapter fourteen Chapter 15 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Africa, by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Ancient Egypt, the Pyramids and the Sphinx. Today we are to learn something of the people who lived in the Nile Valley many thousand years ago. We shall, in our imagination, go back almost to the beginning of history and travel in the footsteps of the kings and people of that time we shall see the pyramids the sphinx and other monuments and later in the museum at cairo the statues of the monarchs who made them and even the very kings themselves for their bodies are preserved to this day the pyramids have for ages been considered among the wonders of the world they are enormous monuments of stone built as tombs by the egyptian rulers four or five thousand years ago the remains of fifty or sixty pyramids have been found in different parts of the nile valley and the three largest and best preserved are here in the desert about eight miles from cairo one of these the great pyramid was constructed by cheops who was king of egypt more than three thousand years before christ was born in going to the pyramids we cross the nile over a magnificent iron bridge guarded by bronze lions and ride upon an electric railway through a long avenue of acacia trees the branches of which intertwine overhead forming an arbor reaching clear to the desert the road is above the fields and the green stretches away to the north and south as far as our eyes can reach while in front is the end of the arbor a patch of light as big around as a drumhead that patch is the desert shortly after leaving cairo we see the pyramids through the trees they seem small at first but they grow rapidly as we come nearer looking like three huge piles of stones standing out against the blue sky it is not until we leave the cars and walk over the sand to them that we can appreciate their immensity now we are in front of the great pyramid as we look up it seems as though the whole sky were walled with stone the top towers high over us almost kissing the white clouds which today are floating in the clear blue of the egyptian heavens the great pyramid was once four hundred and eighty-two feet high and although a vast deal of it has been carted away to make buildings for cairo it is still about four hundred and fifty feet high 
its base covers nearly thirteen acres and its top is a platform so large that a good-sized house could be built upon it it is an almost solid mass of stone made of great blocks which are piled up in the shape of steps growing smaller in size as they rise herodotus the greek historian tells us that this monument was built by forced labor and that it took one hundred thousand men twenty years to construct it while ten years were required to make the road to transport the stones the most of which came from the arabian mountains and were ferried across the nile when cheops died he was buried with his queen inside the pyramid separate rooms having been made for the queen and himself we climb to the top each assisted by three arabs who pull and push us from one great stone ledge to another there are about one hundred and fifty layers of stone each on the average about as high as a dining table so that if our friends at home will go to their dining rooms and climb upon the table one hundred and fifty times they will appreciate something of the work we do in climbing this pyramid they will not be helped however by the black-skinned arabs who almost jerk our arms from the sockets as they drag us from one ledge to another we also go inside and with flashlights take photographs of the rooms in which the bodies of the king and queen were laid each is as big as the ordinary schoolroom and the coffins made of great blocks of granite are of just about the right size to contain the body of a man we are tired when we get down to the desert and are glad to hire camels to ride across the sands to the sphinx another mighty monument erected by the kings of those days no one knows just how old the sphinx is nor why it was made it is an enormous figure with the crouching body of a lion and the head of a man cut out of a solid block of rock the figure is as high as a five-story house and so large that it would about cover the ordinary city lot its body is one hundred and forty feet long and its forelegs measure fifty feet the head of the sphinx is so large that it would fill an ordinary schoolroom a man standing on the tip of its ear could not reach to the crown of the head the ears are each four feet long and the nose measures more than five and one-half feet while its mouth is so big that if it were open an ox or a camel could be put inside it the face of the sphinx is now somewhat mutilated for it has been shot at by the arab soldiers and has been worn away by the sands of the desert which have been blowing upon it for five or six thousand years as we climb upon the great body we wish we could whisper in its ear and ask it to tell us the riddle of its existence and something about the strange people who chiseled it out of the rock all about the sphinx and throughout the desert near cairo are the remains of ancient monuments great chambers have been found under the sand in which mummies jewelry and other things were stored other chambers and pyramids exist farther up the nile on the site of memphis which was the capital of those ancient kings but which has now passed away there are other wonderful ruins at thebes and karnak in upper egypt including the remains of temples and avenues lined with sphinxes and there are also huge statues and other ruins which show us that the ancient egyptians were a civilized people going back to cairo we drive out to see the obelisk on the site of heliopolis the old city of the sun this place was noted for its learning thousands of years ago and it is supposed that the obelisk was here long before jacob came down into egypt it stood on one side of the entrance to the temple of the sun at the end of an avenue of sphinxes we look in vain however for the remains of the palaces temples and schools the obelisk is surrounded by green fields and two blindfolded buffaloes are moving a water wheel at one side of it while beyond are the yellow sands of the desert with the pyramids rising above them in the museum at cairo we see scores of mummies which have been found in the tombs these mummies are the real bodies of the ancient kings so treated with ointments that they have not crumbled to dust the limbs are wrapped around with many cloths and some faces are so lifelike that it seems as though they might talk we look at a princess who may have been the one who found little moses in the bulrushes and linger long before rameses the mummy of an egyptian ruler whose body has been preserved 
in other rooms we examine articles taken from the tombs there are gold bracelets and rings like coiled snakes similar to the jewelry of today. there are fish hooks like the ones we use now trinkets for the toilet writing materials and other things which show us that the egyptians of four thousand years ago were not far different from us end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b a trip through the suez canal we have come from cairo to port said on the mediterranean sea to make a trip through the suez canal before starting on our long journey up the nile we are now at the northeastern corner of africa on the isthmus of suez that little tongue of land which for ages blocked what is now one of the great commercial water routes of the world until a few years ago africa was a peninsula tied to asia by this narrow isthmus then the canal was cut through and the continent became an island do you realize how important this was to the commerce of the world for ages this isthmus of suez was the locked gate on the shortest water route between europe and india china and japan ships could sail in from the atlantic and across the mediterranean to this place and they could come through the indian ocean and up the red sea but here they were stopped the isthmus is a strip of sand so narrow that a railroad train could cross it in a couple of hours but it was as great a barrier to navigation as though it had been the alps or the andes the result was that all vessels carrying goods to and from asia had to sail clear around the cape of good hope the southern end of the african continent the distance was as great as halfway around the world and it took many weeks to make the voyage from time to time men suggested that the isthmus might be cut through but it was not until about the middle of the last century that anything was done then a french civil engineer ferdinand de lesseps brought forth plans for the work and the french aided by the egyptians cut this great trench through the desert and the waters of the mediterranean and the red sea flowed together the trench is eighty-six miles long and so wide and deep that great steamers can sail through harbors were constructed at both ends of the canal to accommodate the shipping parts of the trench were walled with cement to keep back the sand and at every few miles great basins were made for ships to enter while other ships passed them the canal cost more than one hundred million dollars and it took ten years to make it twenty-five thousand arabs and egyptians were kept working upon it and four thousand casks of drinking water were daily carried across the desert on camels to supply them then a small canal was dug from the nile and this is still used to give fresh water to the people who live along the suez canal some of the land along the canal was found to be below the level of the sea those parts needed but little digging and when the canal reached them the salt water flowed in and made lakes there about two-thirds of the whole distance across the isthmus is now taken up by the canal proper and the other third by such lakes as soon as the canal was completed most of the steamers sailing between asia and europe began coming this way the saving in miles for nearly all of them is greater than the distance from our country to china across the pacific and there is also a saving in money although the canal officials charge high rates every ship has to pay a heavy toll in proportion to its size and the number of its passengers the suez canal is open to ships of all nations it is now used by three or four thousand ships every year and several hundred thousand passengers annually ride through it there is so much travel that the waterway is overcrowded and as it has proved to be a profitable undertaking it is now planned to build another canal by its side we find the harbor at port said full of steamers which are waiting to enter the canal or have stopped to coal upon coming out a ship from india loaded with grain lies at one wharf and near it is a vessel from australia with the cargo of wood while we wait an english ship carrying the first tea of the season from china to europe passes by and an american gunboat on its way to the philippines 
starts into the waterway we take passage on a vessel for suez and are soon steaming along through the desert we go slowly for the ships are not allowed to move faster than five miles an hour and at the wider places we frequently receive a signal from one of the stations on the shore to wait until a steamer goes by now we pass a great dredge which is pumping up the sand from the bottom of the canal and throwing it out upon the banks and now go by one of the small towns which has grown up to accommodate the laborers who are employed on the work the canal is so narrow that the ships in the distance seem to be walking as it were in single file through the desert we are close to the shore most of the way and the dry thirsty sand looks drier than ever in contrast with the sea-green water below we pass caravans of camels trotting along their riders bobbing up and down against the clear sky and at one time in the hazy air of the desert see what looks like a city shaded by palms afar off over the sand it fades away as we go onward and we learn that it had no existence but was merely a picture of the air the mirage so often seen in desert lands we stop at ismalia a little town midway through the canal where de lesseps lived while it was building and soon after that enter the lakes scaring up some pink flamingos which are resting on the shores the trip takes us all day and far into the night but we finally reach suez whence we go back to cairo by train end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b nubia from cairo we travel by steamer far up the nile stopping at the chief towns along the banks we visit asiut the capital of upper egypt a thriving city of fifty thousand people and thence steam on to aswan where the great dam is we explore the ruins of mighty temples built by the egyptians of the past and then sail on for days until we at last reach khartoum the chief city of nubia at the junction of the waters of the white nile and blue nile the valley narrows as we go southward we are often close to the desert and sometimes between rocky hills and strips of green marking the banks of the nile everywhere half-naked men and boys are raising the water and pouring it into ditches through which it is conducted over the land everywhere are the same mud villages shaded by date palms which we saw in lower egypt and everywhere donkeys and camels and about the same people we travelled amongst in the delta still farther southward the natives are poorer and the villages meaner there are more negroes in the crowd which comes out to the steamer and the people are wild and savage we pass dark-faced nubians on camels who have ridden in from the desert and now and then meet some redolent of the castor oil or tallow which they have used to grease their bodies and hair we are now in nubia or the egyptian sudan the long strip of arid plains largely desert through which the nile has cut its way down to egypt the country is tributary to egypt and is therefore controlled by the british many of whom we find at khartoum this is important for it is through nubia that a part of the cape to cairo railroad planned to run north and south through the whole continent of africa is to be built we have seen cars puffing along the banks of the nile as we came up to khartoum the railroad already extends from alexandria to where we now are and railroads have been built from the cape of good hope northward for many hundreds of miles by and by lines will be constructed connecting these roads with khartoum branches will be built to the east and west and one will then be able to visit most parts of this wild continent by rail at present the only way of getting about through nubia is on the rivers or by caravan much of the country is thinly settled the nubians live in villages of tents or thatched huts moving about with their herds of cattle camels donkeys sheep and goats from pasture to pasture where the water is plenty they raise tobacco millet and other grains but in general they are herdsmen relying upon their cattle for support the nubians are of several races each of which has its own language 
they have many tribes ruled by sheiks or chiefs they are mohammedans and make pilgrimages to mecca the birthplace of their prophet mohammed we are surprised at the nubians we knew they were black and thought they might be like negroes they are far different although their skins are jet black or dark brown they have features like ours with noses as straight and lips almost as thin as our own they are tall straight and wiry they are said to be strong and are so proud of their power of bearing pain that the young men sometimes engage in flogging matches to see who can endure most such matches are held in the presence of the young women of the village who play a quaint music while the contest goes on the young men step into the ring two at a time each clad in a single cloth about the loins and armed with a long whip of hippopotamus hide as the music strikes up the two men begin to flog each other the whips make the blood come and they continue the struggle until one falls exhausted the man who can stand up the longest against all his fellows is considered the best he is entitled to marry the belle of the village he is the favorite of the women for some time thereafter and bears the proud title of the brother of the girls it is so warm in nubia that one needs but little clothing small children go about naked and many of the older people wear only a strip of cotton cloth about the waist which falls to the knees the most peculiar thing about the nubian is his hair it is so dressed that it stands out in a great mass or brush on the top with a fringe of braids hanging down about the neck covering his ears hairdressing is the most important part of his toilet the hair must be stiff to hold its shape and the stiffening usually consists of tallow taken from a freshly killed sheep the best fat is that which has been well chewed by human teeth and at each dressing the family and friends are called in to chew tallow when the fat is properly mixed it is rubbed in and the hair combed after the latest style in the desert parts of the sudan the bathing is quite as curious as the hairdressing water is scarce and tallow takes its place the person to be bathed stretches himself at full length upon a mat and is then rubbed from head to foot with mutton fat scented with musk or other perfumery after this the body is well kneaded the arms legs and every part of it being rubbed and squeezed this process gives one so the nubians claim a more delightful sensation than a hot water bath let us visit a village and see something of the nubians at home the huts are inside a fence put up as a protection from robbers each hut is circular in shape it is low and has a conical roof there are neither windows nor chimneys and the light comes in through the doors the floor is the ground and the only ceiling is the covering of thatch which forms the roof there is little furniture there are no chairs nor tables the people sit on the floor and more often outside the huts a rude bedstead with a mattress of oxhide strips stands in a corner and some goatskin bags a granite slab a clay griddle several earthenware pots and some beautiful baskets are piled up at one side the granite slab is the mill of the family upon it the millet and other grains are laid and pounded or crushed to a flour the pots griddle and baskets are the cooking utensils the pots are for soups and stews on the griddle is fried the sour bread which forms one of the chief foods and the baskets are the water buckets of the family but how can one carry water in a basket he cannot carry in baskets like ours but these are different they are made of straw so tightly woven that they will hold water they are used as milking pails too and sometimes milk is boiled in them but will not a straw basket burn if one holds it over the fire yes but the nubians do not boil milk in that way they set the baskets down on the ground and drop hot stones into them putting in more and more until the milk boils they cook meat on red-hot stones turning it from side to side until it is thoroughly done the people are hospitable they give us what they have and often refuse to take pay although they accept our presence on leaving we find it especially difficult to pay them for milk for the nubians think that if one takes money for it his cows will go dry these people are fond of their cattle each animal has its own name and every herd has a cow known as the lucky one whose milk is considered better than that of the others 
the cattle are small with humps on their shoulders like those in india they are trained to life in the desert and can go as long as two days without drinking we see many men with lances and shields the nubians are brave warriors and skilful in hunting and trapping the big game found in the wilder parts of the country they catch rhinoceroses hippopotamuses wild boars and pits so made that if the beasts fall in they cannot get out a sharpened post is often fixed in the ground in the centre of a pit the animal falls upon this and is killed such pits are covered with a thin net upon which branches and leaves are spread they sometimes kill an elephant by slipping up and chopping an artery of one of his hind legs with a sword as his blood flows away the beast grows weaker and weaker and finally drops dead the hunter must be careful lest the animal give him a blow with his trunk and he has to be spry or he may be crushed to death with the tusks or huge feet among the most interesting of nubian sports is ostrich hunting ostriches are found in large numbers in the desert and are chased by parties of three or four men on horseback the men look first for the nests and when they find one with an ostrich sitting upon it they station themselves near it on their horses at some distance apart then one rides toward the nest as soon as the ostrich sees him it jumps up and runs away with all its might for a short distance it can go much faster than a horse it usually travels for a couple of miles in a straight line and then circles around so as not to get far from its nest now one of the men gallops after the ostrich until his horse is tired out he then gives a signal and another of the party on a fresh horse starts in and so they go on until the great bird drops exhausted to the ground now the hunter jumps down and chops off its head with his sword he seizes the long neck and thrusts it deep into the sand that the blood may not soil the precious feathers End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the roof of africa abyssinia we have been climbing for days since we left nubia and are now on the high plateau of abyssinia on what might be considered the roof of the continent there are some higher mountains still farther south but africa has no other country on the average so high as this the mean level of the plateau is more than a half mile higher than mount washington with great snow-capped mountains as tall as pike's peak rising above it abyssinia is so beautiful that it has been called the switzerland of africa it is more than fifty times as large as switzerland and in some respects far more beautiful the plateau is made up of tablelands rising one above the other here a great gorge cuts its way through there the plain falls off in a precipice a thousand feet deep and some miles farther on it rises in bluffs to the plains below in almost the centre of the country is lake tisana and down the sides of the plateau and running through it now falling in cataracts and now raging in torrents through narrow canyons flow great rivers some of which lose themselves in the sand and others such as the atbara and the blue nile go on to the nile proper giving food and water to egypt we have already seen how egypt is the child of abyssinia in that its rich soil carried down by the rivers has been spread over the desert what must be the nature of a land that has furnished such soil year after year and age after age it must be very rich must it not that is the character of abyssinia we might consider this country an island of the richest soil rising high above a sea of deserts and swamps situated in the tropics the water-laden winds of the indian ocean strike its cold mountains so that at certain seasons the rain comes down in torrents washing the soil into the valleys and filling the rivers which spread it over the country below we notice the wonderful fertility of the land as we travel from place to place the plateaus rise one above the other each having its own plants trees and flowers in the lowlands it is hot and there are jungles of bamboos so dense 
that it is almost impossible to make one's way through them there are fields of sugar and cotton and the fruits of the tropics higher up coffee is grown and still higher all the plants and grains of the temperate zone in many parts of abyssinia coffee grows wild it thrives especially in one province and from there it is said the first coffee beans were carried long ago to arabia and thence spread all over the world the name of this province is kaffa and from it comes the word coffee the natives there do not cultivate the coffee plants but the soil is such that the plants grow into trees so large that they are sometimes cut down and made into boards the soil of abyssinia is so rich in places that it gives four crops in one year the people are lazy and plant only enough for their needs they raise little patches of corn wheat durra sorghum and canary seeds which they grind into flour for bread much of abyssinia is like a great park with clumps of trees here and there it has pastures so rich that they can support large flocks of sheep and goats and droves of ponies and donkeys and fine cattle with bumps on their backs these pastures make the country a fine place for game there are thousands of antelopes zebras and ostriches and so many elephants that one sometimes sees a hundred marching together through the woods there are hippopotamuses in the rivers and we must be on our guard against the hyenas leopards and lions as we go through the forests the abyssinians are famous lion hunters and some of the warriors wear lion skins on their shoulders when the president of the united states sent an embassy to abyssinia a few years ago the king of that country ordered two lions to be sent back to him as a present there are many wild birds with beautiful plumage and bees are so common that the favorite drink of the people is a fermented mixture of honey and water the abyssinians are not unlike some inhabitants of the sahara they have black or brown faces with features much like our own they are tall straight and fine-looking they dress in cottons many of which come from our country the men wear long robes of white with a red stripe a foot wide woven through the middle under this robe they have shirts and tight drawers the richer men have cloaks of silk or velvet thrown over their shoulders and a few wear lion skins as signs of rank the poorer class of abyssinian women wear white cotton dresses they go barefooted and often bareheaded although some have shawls tied about their heads the richer women often travel upon mules accompanied by soldiers their dresses are usually cotton although some have capes of black satin and broad-brimmed felt hats over which they wear veils of silk both rich and poor have a cord around the neck to which are tied crosses earpicks and charms the children dress much like their parents except in the hot lowlands where they wear almost no clothing the abyssinians live in small villages of round huts made of poles thatched with leaves and grass there are but few towns and about the only place that can be called a city is the capital where the king lives this during recent years has been at addis ababa in about the centre of the country it lies on a high plain with a mud wall around it and it is more like a great camp than a city its houses consist of these same round tent-shaped mud huts and a number of large buildings which are the palaces of the king although abyssinia is ruled by a king there are many tribes each of which has its own chief and under officials the king has a large army and he expects every one of his subjects to be a soldier boys are taken into the army long before the age at which our boys leave school at eight or ten each boy becomes a servant of a soldier he walks before the soldier in time of peace carrying his gun which he is expected to keep clean and in good order he helps take care of the horse and mule of his master and learns to walk far without tiring we try a race with some of the boys and find they outrun us they climb up hill and down at great speed keeping along with the troops on the march during our journey we meet beggars hobbling about upon crutches and are surprised to see some with only one hand and one foot we ask whether they have lost their limbs fighting and are told that they are so maimed because they were thieves 
the first time a man is caught stealing he is whipped the second time his hand is cut off and if he steals a third time and is found out he loses one of his feet the same punishment is given deserters from the army although abyssinia is so rich its products are small the chief exports are coffee gum and wax and also gold and ivory the trade in which is controlled by the king the business is done in markets held from time to time in the various villages the natives for miles around come to such markets to buy and sell their cattle and grain the money used in trading is different in different parts of the country but one can buy goods everywhere with salt or cotton cloth the salt comes from a dry salt lake near the red sea it is made in bars about a foot long and two inches thick if the bar is cracked or chipped or does not ring right the people will not accept it every one carries some of this money with him and when two persons meet each breaks off a piece of salt and offers it to the other just as some of our people offer their friends cigars each eats the salt and then bowing low goes on his way we soon fall into the custom and carry salt sticks in our pockets as strangers often ask us to have a bite of salt with them upon meeting the cotton money is white cloth imported from america in addition to this there are silver dollars worth about fifty cents gun cartridges which pass for two or three cents apiece and far back in the interior strips of iron each worth one or two cents we carry some of all kinds of money with us and have no trouble in making our way as we have a permit from the king to go through the land we buy ponies and mules and ride from place to place there is only one railroad and that is from djibouti on the coast to the town of harar in the southern part of abyssinia the country roads are mere tracks and much of our way is up and down hill we have little trouble about food we shoot game on the way and buy chickens mutton and beef in the native markets we do our own cooking for the abyssinians prefer their beef so rare that raw meat is served at nearly every feast they put red pepper on such meat and sometimes make pellets of raw beef filled with red pepper and onions and eat them their bread is in thin flat cakes of about the size of a handkerchief it is damp flabby and often sour the common abyssinian eats sitting cross-legged or squatting on the floor and at each meal he has a pile of these bread cakes beside him he uses the top one as a napkin the second he folds up and dips into a bowl of melted butter in which red pepper is mixed and when it is well soaked he squeezes it up in his hands and crams it into his mouth he consumes his meat in large slices putting one end of the slice in his mouth and cutting off as much as he can hold there by a stroke of his knife or sword the other end of the slice being held in the hand soup is often served with meat in such cases the bread is soaked in the soup and the meat is taken out and laid on the soaked bread at the feasts of the better classes servants sometimes are required to eat a bit of each dish before the others partake to show that it is not poisoned these people have a low state of civilization there are no schools to speak of and but few can read and write they have their own calendar dividing the year into twelve months of thirty days each and adding five extra days at the end to make the year come out even the last five days are holidays every leap year they have an extra holiday the abyssinians are christians but they are superstitious their religion being somewhat like that of the copts of egypt we visit the churches and listen to the dark-faced priests singing the service while other priests go about through the audience swinging urns in which incense is burning each priest wears a robe decorated with silver sometimes the bishop carries about a silver cross and allows each of the worshippers to kiss it there are no seats in the churches and every one stands leaning on a stick while he listens we are handed leaning sticks as we come in and the girls are told to go on one side of the church with the women while the boys are led to the other side with the men a white curtain separating the sexes end of chapter eighteen
chapter nineteen of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b across british east africa by rail we make our way from abyssinia down to the sea coast travelling through the land of the somali a semi-savage race of blacks who inhabit the desert lands along the coast about and south of the horn of east africa their country is large being controlled in different parts by the french italians and british the natives are not unlike the people we saw in the sahara they have herds of camels goats and sheep and move about from place to place seeking pasture some tribes have villages of rude huts with walls of basket work and roofs of woven thatch the doors are hinged at the top instead of of the sides so that they can be raised to form an awning during the heat of the day at the coast we take passage on a ship and sail past cape guardafi at the tip of the horn and thence on south until we reach mombasa on the little island of mombasa close to the mainland we are now four degrees south of the equator in one of the most bustling places of this part of the world mombasa is not only the capital of british east africa but also the port for the important british state of uganda which lies in the highlands about as far inland from the indian ocean as ohio is distant from the atlantic the british have a vast amount of land on this continent we have seen how they practically control egypt and that part of nubia south of it along the course of the nile their province of uganda south of nubia includes the best of the highlands about lake victoria from which the nile comes so that they now practically control all the land along that mighty river from its source to its mouth uganda alone is twice as large as ohio and british east africa which is between uganda and the indian ocean is ten times as large as our state of indiana both provinces have much valuable land which the british are opening up to development and trade they have built a railroad from mombasa across british east africa to lake victoria so that we can travel to the highlands of uganda by comfortable cars we first explore mombasa it is a thriving little city with good hotels and playgrounds for cricket football and other sports it is inhabited by people from asia africa and europe the africans are mohammedan traders in turbans and gowns and black-faced people from the mainland who act as servants and do most of the hard work the asiatics are largely brown-skinned hindus who have come from india to engage in storekeeping and banking and to act as clerks on the railway the europeans are british officials and merchants and also germans and french who have come here to trade many of the natives are almost naked although they delight in jewelry of different kinds the women have holes in the lobes of their ears and often along the whole outer rims and wear buttons of gold silver and other metals in them some have nose rings and some have buttons in their nostrils many of them look like negroes and others not so black have features almost as regular as our own leaving mombasa by train we cross the bridge over the strait to the mainland and are soon on our way through the wilds of eastern africa the railroad is a narrow gauge and the cars are quite small now and then we pass a train loaded with tusks of ivory bales of hides india rubber and also cattle sheep donkeys and goats we learn that horses mules donkeys sheep and goats are often carried on the same train with the passengers a horse goes as a first-class fare a donkey pays second and a sheep or goat is carried at third-class rate this may be different as the traffic increases now we have left the sea-coast and are far back in the country climbing the hills we rise rapidly and at kew station enter the athi plains a vast rolling country covered with grass supporting countless herds of game we cross these plains to nairobi the most important railway and military station upon the line where we stop a few days to enjoy the beautiful scenery mount kenia and kilimanjaro can both be seen from nairobi and the climate is delightful 
going onward we rise to a distance of more than a mile and a half above the sea passing through the great rift valley and then descend to port florence situated on the shores of the great victoria nyanza most of our journey is through the wilds now over plains and now through dense forests we pass many native villages and strange people curiously dressed who stand and watch the train as it goes whizzing by now an ostrich races along almost even with the car windows and now we see a great herd of striped zebras galloping away in crossing a stream we surprise a hippopotamus wading along the marshy banks and the conductor tells us that rhinoceroses have at times charged the locomotives and that when the road was building one butted a caboose that stood on a down grade so that the brakes loosened and the car smashed into a little railroad station half wrecking it there are also antelopes of different kinds and at night we hear the hyenas howling out their hoo ye you the natives are strange in the extreme we pass villages of low huts built in a circle so that the cattle can be kept inside at night the houses are long and narrow with doors so arranged that the sheep and goats run in and out at will some villages have fences of thorns about them to keep out the wild beasts we see cattle and sheep feeding watched by dark-skinned shepherds and now and then a warrior his head decorated with ostrich feathers and his body painted to make him look fierce he carries a shield lance and sword and might be dangerous if we met him alone in the wilds the natives gather around the cars as we stop at the stations there are black-skinned men and boys with great holes in the lobes of their ears in which pieces of wood or other things are inserted and girls with shaved heads who wear as ornaments telegraph wire wrapped around the legs arms and neck so tightly that only a blacksmith can remove it some are dressed in calicoes and others have bullock hides wrapped around them in another province the women wear short petticoats of bark cloth the children have almost no clothing but even the little boys have holes in their ears so big that they can put two fingers through them these people inhabit the slopes of kilimanjaro and mount kenia and the high plateau region between them which is rich in forests and pastures they are noted as cattle breeders and as warriors farther east we see other strange races each having its own customs and dress and at the end of the road at port florence upon lake victoria the people are if anything stranger than ever end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b about lake victoria before we go farther let us stop and think just where we are we have been traveling so fast that our brains have grown tired in trying to understand all we see everything is new and different from what we expected we are on the hot continent of africa and not far from the equator but the weather is pleasant and the breezes from lake victoria are cool we are on a high rolling plateau with mountains rising here and there far above it to the east and south is kilimanjaro so far away that we cannot see it it is one of the tallest mountains in africa and among the great mountains of the world although near the equator its top is crowned with perpetual snow farther northward between us and the coast is mount kenia almost as tall and on the west on the other side of uganda are the ruwenzori mountains which some say are quite as high if not higher than kilimanjaro itself all the land about us is far above the level of the sea it consists of rolling plains with gorges here and there running through them and great troughs and basins in which are some of the largest lakes of the world such as lake tanganyika lying between german east africa and the upper congo lake albert edward and lake albert on the west of uganda lake rudolph in british east africa and lake victoria the northern half of which belongs to the british and the southern half to the germans lake victoria is larger than lake huron 
almost three times the size of lake erie and next to lake superior the largest lake of the world its waters have a deep blue color when looked upon from a distance but they are as clear as crystal and sweet to the taste the banks of the lake are grassy hills and rugged rocks in some places near the shore the water is shallow and there we see beds of papyrus reeds the lairs of hippopotamuses and crocodiles there are many large islands some of which are inhabited by half-naked people and also floating islands of papyrus reeds patches which have been torn loose from the bed of the lake and moved to and fro with the current the british have steamers here and we make an excursion on one of them calling at the villages along the shore at some places the natives are fierce and we hardly dare land they stone us with slings and shake their spears at us at other ports the people are more friendly and we are treated to roast kid clotted milk bananas and sweet potatoes in Cavirondo, northeast of lake victoria the natives go naked although they twist iron wire about their arms necks and ankles as ornaments the women shave their heads they have bracelets of ivory and necklaces of shells in usoga the next province almost all the people are dressed the women wear bark petticoats and the men have clothes of bark or cotton in another province near by the girls wear a string of beads about the waist until they are married when they put on bark cloth skirts on the west of the lake some of the people wear clothes of grass and skins we shall find new and odd costumes at every few miles the villages of this part of the world are much alike in cavirondo they are made up of little round huts with conical roofs thatched with grass and in usoga the ordinary house makes one think of a haycock there the villages are often surrounded with fences of thorn bushes to keep out the wild beasts and the houses are built in a circle about an enclosure where the cattle goats and sheep are kept at night they sometimes sleep in the huts with the people we see many such animals near the villages on the banks of the lake in our tour of the lake we first make our way to napoleon gulf at the north to visit the ripon falls where the waters flow out forming the birthplace of the nile the falls are not more than thirteen feet deep and the river below is about thirteen hundred feet wide here we can stand on the high banks and look down upon the nile at its beginning great fish are leaping high in the air and dark-skinned natives are standing upon the rocks spearing them with harpoons as they jump we are surrounded by green forest trees in which odd birds sing the rocks through which the waters flow are covered with white the guano of the cormorants and other birds which make their homes here we next cross lake victoria to the mouth of the kagara river the largest stream that flows into it and therefore said by some to be the real source of the nile we travel some distance up this river through lands inhabited by black people scantily dressed in skins and aprons of grass they are barefooted and bareheaded some have tattooed breasts and arms and others shave their heads in patches so as to leave rolls of hair on parts of the head they are excellent blacksmiths and we buy some of their spears and knives to take home as trophies nearer the lake are more people dressed in bark clothing and at one of our stops we have an opportunity to see how bark cloth is made the cloth comes from a stately tree with small green leaves a straight stem and many branches the bark is taken off by making two cuts around the trunk several feet apart and then a third cut down the trunk between them by this means a cylinder of bark is torn off in one piece the bark is now soaked in water until it is soft and then pounded flat on a smooth wooden log when the rough outer coat comes off leaving the soft inner coat which is almost as fine as woven cloth the color of the bark is now reddish brown it may be used as it is or dyed or decorated with patterns such cloth is worn by both men and women sometimes in gowns which fall to the feet sometimes in short petticoats and again as skirts and cloaks the ladies of uganda it is said like the rustle of their bark cloth dresses when they are new and stiff 
just as our ladies like that of silk skirts farther south along lake victoria in the german possessions the land is so fertile that it may some day be one of the granaries of africa the natives here are blacks with negro features and are the more ugly from their custom of knocking out their front teeth they have a sultan and also independent chiefs they dwell in villages of round thatched huts about five feet high with conical roofs each roof extends out so as to make a kind of porch above the house and there are often partitions inside the hut dividing the sleeping and other rooms sheep goats and chickens live with the family and the rooms are not very clean in some villages the houses are built in a circle at a fixed distance apart thorn hedges connecting them in such a way that they form an enclosure in which the cattle and sheep are kept at night the people sleep with wooden pillows on beds of skins or upon the floor they wear very little clothing some having only an apron of leather they have necklaces of crocodile teeth and cowrie shells and anklets of brass iron or copper some wear wide bands of ivory hollowed out of elephants tusks they use shields and spears for fighting and also bows and poison arrows everywhere we go we see the women working in the fields and more seldom the men in many of the african tribes the women do all the work but in some about the lower shores of lake victoria the husband goes out into the field while the wife cleans up the house and cooks breakfast she carries the breakfast with her to the fields and after the meal has been eaten joins her husband in the work a man may have as many wives as he can afford to buy six cows is considered a fair price for a girl and if the marriage is not satisfactory the wife can go back home provided her family return the cattle End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in uganda traveling northward across lake victoria we enter the state of uganda and move about from place to place exploring the country uganda is one of the most valuable and interesting of the african provinces it is a beautiful land about twice as large as the state of ohio with grassy plains lofty mountains and dark valleys the best soil is of a rich red there are hills of fine pasture dense woods filled with big game swamps choked with papyrus reeds in which rhinoceroses and hippopotamuses are found and other regions where the grass is ten feet in height there are also vast stretches of meadowland spotted with groves of beautiful trees and dotted here and there with villages about which are small gardens and farms the people of uganda have a higher civilization than any of the other tribes of central africa with a government of their own which they manage under the british there is a king and a native assembly which rules the people through the chiefs the people of uganda are intelligent they have a system of numerals of their own based upon decimals they are anxious to learn and they welcome the christian missionaries who are working among them they are polite neat clean and modest they all wear clothing either of bark cloth or cotton although some of them take their clothes off when they sit down to their meals in the huts this we suppose is to keep the clothes clean they are hospitable and we have no trouble in learning just how they live the huts of uganda are perhaps the largest and best in all africa they are much like haystacks in shape rising from the ground in a cone the doorway is cut in the side of the hut with a bonnet-like projection over it the houses are made of a framework of wood covered with reeds which is then faced with grass mats and laced with sticks or bark the walls are thick and the houses are comfortable entering one of these homes we find that the roof is supported by many poles so arranged that they divide the interior into two apartments front and rear in the back around the wall are bunks in which the family sleep at night about the chief huts are sometimes smaller ones where the women work making wine 
drying tobacco or grinding flour some dwellings have separate huts for kitchens others are quite small the cooking being done over a fire hole in the centre the floor of such a house is the ground it is covered with soft grass a new carpet of this kind being spread upon the old when it becomes dirty or wet some families let the chickens goats and sheep sleep indoors at night and we find that the dwellings are none too clean after all these people have but little furniture the ordinary family is satisfied with a few stools a half dozen earthenware pots some wooden bowls and basins made of wicker or grass the bark cloth clothing and other treasures are tied to the roof or hung upon the poles which uphold it there may be spears shields and hoes standing against the walls of the hut the villages are usually situated in groves surrounded by pasture lands the people have fine cattle with humps on their backs and also fat-tailed sheep and goats they raise chickens and have dogs which seldom bark nearly every family has a garden of sweet potatoes and other vegetables and some have patches of grain sugar-cane and coffee we see banana groves everywhere not only here but in the other states of central africa and are told that the banana is most valuable to the natives it gives them food and drink and they use it for string soap timber and clothing the green fruit is cooked as a vegetable and when ripe it serves as a dessert the banana is in fact the chief food of these people taking almost the same place that wheat and corn have with us the green bananas are tied up in banana leaves and steamed until they are well done the flesh is then floury sweet and palatable and when dried it may be made into flour banana leaves are used to thatch houses they serve as tablecloths and napkins they take the place of paper they are the covers for milk and water baskets the stems of the banana are sometimes made into fences and their pith is scraped out and used as a sponge the fibres form excellent cord and may be woven into sun hats and shields there is an intoxicating drink made from the banana which might be called banana brandy and another less strong which might pass as banana beer while a third banana drink is not intoxicating at all if the native has bananas in plenty he thrives if not he is likely to starve we have but little trouble making our way through uganda there are many roads and the people are ready to help us about we find them kind and hospitable and far superior to those whom we met on our tour of the lakes the men are skilful blacksmiths and the women weave beautiful mats and basket work using the leaves of the wild date palm we are delighted with the children and now and then stop to have games with them the boys are fond of wrestling they play ball and throw sticks in a remarkable way they learn to hurl spears and to use shields to protect themselves and have many sham battles among their duties is watching the cattle and sheep but their happiest days are when their fathers or brothers take them out with them to trap the game for which the country is noted during our stay with the british officers we talk much about the future of central africa they point out the richness of the soil and its value for grazing telling us that uganda will some day be one of the chief cattle raising countries of the world they describe how the railroad now planned from cairo to the cape of good hope will eventually be extended northward through this region where it will connect with the road from khartoum now built along the nile this will give a railroad from one end of africa to the other and will make many changes in this faraway land end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b elephants and ivory elephants are found in asia and in africa but the largest and fiercest come from africa and especially from the region where we are now travelling the african elephant differs from its asiatic brother in that it has larger tusks a more sloping forehead and wide flapping ears the elephants of asia are sometimes caught and tamed 
they are used as beasts of burden and are made to work in the lumber yards in parts of india burma and siam people travel from place to place upon them and the rajahs or princes ride them when they go about in state the african elephant seldom becomes tame it lives in the forests or on the plains of the wilder regions of the continent it is hunted for its ivory tusks and is gradually being exterminated in those regions where white men are settling in some parts of the african states elephants are almost as great a curiosity as buffaloes in our country but in other places such as the congo valley the sudan and the highlands of central africa where we now are they roam about in vast numbers and we may often stumble upon herds as we go through the forests elephants travel in company parents and babies old and young moving along together sometimes several hundred may be seen marching from one place to another the mother and children going in front while the father elephants come behind protecting the rear the fathers are larger and stronger than the mothers and they will fight for their families the mothers will also fight elephants are fond of their children and it would be dangerous indeed for us to try to steal a baby elephant besides it would take more strength than we have to carry one away for the ordinary elephant baby weighs as much as a big fat man and it grows fast the elephant is the largest beast known there are many in africa which weigh three or four tons and have such big legs that one might take them for trees if he were looking along the ground through the forest notwithstanding their size these animals travel rapidly their weight enables them to crush through the jungles they step lightly with their huge feet and when traveling will go for days at an average speed of six miles an hour they can swim rivers and climb up and down hills so that it is difficult for men to keep up with them the head of the elephant is the most remarkable part of its body it is of enormous size with little eyes not much larger around than our own a long nose or trunk and tusks larger than those of any other animal the elephant's trunk is so important to him that he could not possibly get along without it it serves as both hand and nose if it should be cut off he would starve for his neck and tusks would not allow him to get his mouth to the ground and he could not drink the trunk is as flexible as indian rubber it has hundreds of different muscles running through it in almost every direction and it can be stretched or shortened at will at the end there is a kind of finger-like lip with which the animal can pick up a blade of grass or the smallest thing from the ground the lip is very strong as is the whole trunk the beast pulls off reeds branches and herbage with his trunk he rears up on his hind legs and tears down young trees or bends them over into his mouth so that he may eat the tender shoots and leaves in drinking the elephant first sucks the water into his trunk and then squirts it into his mouth he often sprays his body in this way giving himself a shower bath as it were he uses his trunk to feel with rubbing it over his baby to pet it when angry he throws the trunk high in the air and blows a trumpet blast through it and when attacked he sometimes pounds his enemy to death with it there are two other parts of the elephant's head which are even more interesting these are the tusks or great horn-like teeth which grow out of each side of its mouth every elephant has two tusks and in addition six great teeth within the mouth on each side of the jaw above and below the tusks are fitted into bony sockets their roots going almost up to the eyes of the elephants they begin to come when the elephants are quite young and continue to grow as long as they live some elephants live to be a hundred years old and the older ones have tusks more than eight feet long and so heavy that it takes four men to carry one across the country the tusks are a valuable article of commerce and are among the things which africa exports to all parts of the world ivory is worth so much that ships are sent to africa for it men hunt the elephants and carry the tusks for hundreds of miles through the forests to get money for them much of this work is done by slaves the arabs and other strong races forcing them to carry the ivory sometimes slaves are exchanged for ivory and in times past the slaves were made to carry the tusks to the seashore 
where both slaves and ivory were sold elephants tusks are of different sizes according to the age of the animal a large one may weigh two hundred pounds and be worth hundreds of dollars such is the tusk shown in the picture a small tusk may not be as long as one's arm so much ivory is needed that more than fifty thousand elephants are annually killed and their tusks shipped to europe most of them coming from the valley of the congo the ivory of commerce comes not only from elephants thus killed but also from those which have died generations ago many elephants die natural deaths in the forest wilds some are killed by lions and other wild beasts the skeletons are found by ivory hunters and their tusks taken out and carried to the market the native kings often have ivory stored away in their villages and it is said that some have fences of tusks about their huts they know that ivory is valuable and save it as we save money all such ivory is old and not so valuable as the fresh ivory it is known in the markets as dead ivory while that which comes from the freshly killed beasts is live ivory we shall have many invitations during our travels to go elephant hunting but the sport is so dangerous that we shall hardly accept the natives say it is more dangerous to hunt elephants than lions the elephant is revengeful and if attacked will run after his enemies and try to kill them if he can get the hunters within range of his trunk he will knock them down with it and crush them to death with his tusks or stamp upon them with his huge feet the elephant has such a thick skin that heavy guns with large bullets are needed and even then there are only a few places where a shot will prove fatal if one can hit him just over the eye or back of the ears or halfway between the ear and the eye there is a fair chance of killing him there is also a place near the tail where a bullet may pass along the spine into the lungs causing the animal to bleed to death in such hunting the men must be wary for the moment the elephant sees them he throws his trunk into the air screams hisses snorts and rushes at them his brother elephants join him and often the hunters are killed notwithstanding this the natives manage to destroy many elephants they sneak up behind one of the great beasts and with a stroke of the sword so cut the tendons and arteries of his hind foot that he is lamed and bleeds to death they arrange a snare so that when an elephant stumbles upon it a heavy weight with a barbed spear fastened to it falls down upon his back the spear is sharp and if its blade enters the elephant's lungs it causes death after an elephant is killed the tusks are chopped out with axes and the flesh is cut from the bones for food the natives are fond of the meat and they eat every part of the animal except the skin and bones they make elephant soup steaks and roasts and preserve some of the flesh by smoking it as we smoke beef the tidbits of the elephant are the feet and trunk these are roasted in a peculiar way a hole is dug in the ground and a fire built in it when the earth has become thoroughly hot all but the glowing coals are taken away and the foot or trunk is laid upon them sticks are then placed over the top of the hole closing it tight after several hours this curious oven is opened and the roast taken out the skin is removed and the meat is ready for eating the foot thus prepared is so tender that it can be scraped out with a spoon and many think it delicious End of section 22. Chapter 23 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Africa, by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Strange Animals of Africa. Africa is the continent of big game. It has the largest beasts and the most dangerous it has many strange animals not found in other parts of the world there are vast territories which are still wild and we shall be meeting odd creatures everywhere during our travels we shall see more hippopotamuses and rhinoceroses as we go on southward or in our travels through the congo valley the hippopotamus is found in many parts of africa it lives in the swamps or along the lakes and rivers eating the grass and plants which grow in and near the water these beasts always travel in herds they are fond of one another and now and then a mother hippopotamus may be seen swimming a stream with her baby standing upon her back the hippopotamus is not so large as the elephant 
but it is an enormous beast nevertheless it has a big head and a short thick neck with small eyes and ears so high up in the head that they remain outside the water when the rest of the animal is almost hidden beneath it it has twelve tusks in the form of teeth strong enough to bite through a small tree and so placed that they cut grass or corn almost as if with a scythe it has twenty-four other teeth which it uses to grind its food the tusks are valuable as ivory and the animal is killed for them and also for its thick skin and flesh the natives like hippopotamus meat and they consider the fat which lies under the skin of the back a great delicacy they are fond of the tongue and make a jelly of the feet they also render out the fat for medicine hippopotamuses are weary and it is difficult to kill them their skins are so thick that large guns must be used the best place for a shot is just below the eye or back of the head between the ears the hippopotamus swims with the greater part of its body under water and it often lies in the water showing only its ears and nose when alarmed it dives and may not come up for a long time the natives hunt it with canoes using harpoons to which large wooden floats are attached if the animal is killed the floats show where it lies such hunting is dangerous for the beasts will fight if attacked they cannot see far however and for that reason are easier to kill than elephants the rhinoceros is also dangerous it is about as large as the hippopotamus and of somewhat the same shape it has one or two great horns growing out of its nose with which it can impale a man or even a horse the word rhinoceros means nose horned and it is about the only animal which has a horn growing from the top of its nose these horns are of different lengths according to the species some being short and others three or four feet in length the animal uses the horn not only for defence but also to dig up the bushes small trees and roots upon which it feeds it has a lip somewhat like that of the elephant's trunk with which it can pick up small objects the skin upon the back and sides of the rhinoceros is twice as thick as this book although it is less thick over the abdomen it makes excellent whips and is so used by the natives they cut the skin into long narrow strips one end of which they tie to the branch of a tree a heavy stone is fastened to the lower end of each strip to keep it stretched after it has dried hard it is scraped round and smoothed off with sand or stone the rhinoceros like the hippopotamus and the elephant has an enormous head a short and thick neck and huge feet the foot of the elephant is the largest the rhinoceros has three toes on each foot the hippopotamus four and the elephant five all three animals are difficult to kill all are exceedingly heavy as we should surely know if one trod upon us although the lion is called the king of the desert we saw none during our travels in the sahara but few lions are found in the desert except near the oases or along the edges the true home of this beast is on the high pasture lands and other fertile parts of the country lions live upon deer antelope and other game and such game is found only where there is good pasture or woods there are many lions in abyssinia in uganda and in different parts of central and southern africa they are hunted by both whites and natives although every one is afraid of them the natives sometimes catch lions in traps which they bait with live goats or sheep they also make pits with sharp stakes at the bottom upon which the lion falls and is killed in addition to these dangerous animals africa has many less harmful and some not dangerous at all it might be called the home of the antelope and the gazelle it has many varieties of deer and some which seem to be half deer and half horse the wildebeest has the tail and mane of a horse and horns of an ox while upon its chin is a shaggy tuft of beard like a goat the elan and the kudu are antelopes found in southern africa the steinbach antelope which enjoys a wide range has a short tail and the paw antelope is not much larger than a rabbit gazelles are small deer-like animals with horns they are very beautiful and graceful we have all heard of the giraffe and find it interesting to study in its home the largest giraffe is so tall that it could stand upon the ground and look down into the chimneys of an ordinary cottage 
it has a neck so long that it can easily pick the leaves of trees which form its principal food and its tongue is so long and strong that it can wrap it around the leaves to pull them off giraffes are usually of a light fawn color with dark spots somewhat like a leopard they are often called camel leopards because they look like a combination of camel and leopard the giraffe runs like a camel and it can go so fast that it is not easily captured it has hoofs and if attacked in the woods it will jump upon its enemy with its forefeet it is found in different parts of africa and especially along the desert the arabs hunt it for its skin out of which they make shields they also use its sinews for thread and string in this region where we now are there are many zebras and we often think it would be fine if we could tame these wild striped ponies and take them back to our homes we saw great herds of them in the wilder parts of abyssinia and they are also to be found in the mountains of british east africa they go galloping over the hills their striped coats shining in the light of the tropical sun now and then we hear one call out to his fellows his cry is not like the neigh of the horse nor the bray of the donkey but a shrill yap 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 we learn that the natives kill zebras for their meat and tan their hides for mats and leather in addition to the animals which we have seen africa has many monkeys gorillas leopards hyenas and other wild beasts it has buffaloes and wild hogs and also odd reptiles birds and strange insects end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in the sudan our next travels are to be in the sudan that vast strip of country between the sahara and the gulf of guinea extending from the atlantic ocean clear across the continent to the highlands of abyssinia the sudan is geographically divided into three parts the egyptian sudan containing the basin of the upper nile which we have already seen the central sudan including lake chad and the western sudan comprising the basins of the senegal niger and other rivers which flow into the atlantic ocean the country is politically divided amongst the french german and british who have taken possession of it on the ground of exploration or through their treaties with the natives it is also otherwise divided according to its native tribes this territory is so large that we can explore only the principal parts of it the distance across it from east to west is greater than from new york to san francisco and its width from north to south is greater than the distance from chicago to new orleans the different parts of the country vary in character in the north beginning with the semi-arid regions which border the sahara it has high fertile plains dotted with magnificent trees here the climate is good and the people are somewhat civilized farther south there is a dense belt of forest and along the coast the land is swampy the lower part of it contains hundreds of streams and waterways form the chief means of moving from one place to another this region is unhealthful for foreigners fevers are common and so many europeans and americans have died here that the land has been called the white man's grave nevertheless it is the home of many thousand natives its people are almost savage some of the tribes going naked and some having human sacrifices why is this country called the sudan words always mean something and there must be a reason for the name the word sudan means black and the sudan is the land of the blacks it is the true home of the negro and parts of it are inhabited by many millions belonging to that race we have already seen that there are other races than the negro in africa the continent has four principal races and many subordinate ones made by the principal ones mixing together most of the northern natives are the descendants of the white type of mankind while those of the southern sudan and southern africa are of two races of the black type the northern africans of various tribes are the descendants of the semitic and hamitic races they are much like us having similar features and sometimes as we saw in the atlas mountains skins almost as white as our own the black races are the negroes 
who are found in their purest state in the southern sudan along the gulf of guinea and also the bushmen and hottentots who live in the southern part of the continent these black races have somewhat similar features they have woolly hair thick lips and flat noses but the hottentots and bushmen have lighter skins and more prominent cheekbones than the pure negroes in addition to these races there are many others formed by the different races mixing together africa has thousands of independent tribes which have always been warring upon one another captives taken in battle have become slaves and slaves have been carried from country to country and sold they have sometimes intermarried with their captors so that in places it is almost impossible to tell where one race ends and another begins the people are sometimes classed according to the language they speak there are many different languages used in the different parts of africa in the congo basin and in the southern half of the continent there are tribes which speak the bantu language and for this reason they are referred to by the common name of bantus we shall hear this name as we go on with our travels our first journey through the sudan shall be to the high plains where we may perhaps meet some of the old friends with whom we travelled in the sahara caravans are always moving across the sands from the mediterranean to these plains carrying goods there are a number of caravan routes and great market towns to which the caravans come the most important of these are timbuktu in the french sudan kano in northern nigeria and kuka on lake chad the two latter towns being in the british sudan these places are at wide distances apart but they are all on the highlands not far from the sahara and their people have been trading for many centuries with the more civilized people of the north the chief trade routes of the northern sudan run east and west on account of the dense forests which lie farther south they are little more than paths through the country and we shall not attempt to describe our slow marches from place to place End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b about kuka and lake chad we have sailed down the nile from uganda for some distance and thence crossed the vast expanse of country between that river and lake chad to kuka the capital of bornu on the western side of the lake we have met many caravans on our way and as we near kuka we see long strings of camels going in and coming out of its gates the tail of each camel is tied by a string to the nose of the one behind it so that if one wishes to pass he has to wait until the whole caravan has gone by the caravans coming in have just arrived from the desert and those going out are on their way north through the different oases to the mediterranean now we have passed through the gate and are in kuka what an odd city we can see a great part of the town as we sit on our camels it is composed of thousands of thatched huts with here and there a one or two-story building the city has two sections each surrounded by a white clay wall in one live the king his nobles and some of the army and in the other the arab merchants and the common people between the two lies the market thronged with donkeys and camels horses and mules and the thousands of odd characters which make up the city there are native soldiers moving about some are armed with lances spears and swords and others with guns we learn that the king of bornu is powerful and that he has many men in his army bornu has for ages been noted as one of the chief kingdoms of africa and it has a written history which can be traced back a thousand years it was once the centre of a great empire and its people grew rich through their wars and by trading their wealth spoiled them and they neglected to keep up their army and were afterward destroyed since then other empires have risen and fallen and even today the country is great it has a territory a little larger than the state of illinois and its population is supposed to number several millions the people are mostly mohammedans they are great traders dealing largely in slaves whom they buy or capture from the neighboring tribes and send across the sahara 
they hunt elephants and ostriches exchanging the feathers and ivory for european goods which they in turn send farther south to sell many of the natives are farmers the country has a fertile soil we have already passed by little plantations of cotton wheat millet and other grains on our way here there are also groves of bananas and delicious fruits they have excellent horses and we have no trouble in hiring saddle animals for a trip about the country we take rides along the shores of lake chad keeping well out of the way of the hippopotamuses which are to be seen here and there with their noses just above the surface of the water or wading about in the shallows near the shore now and then we take a ride in one of the native boats the lake is by no means so beautiful nor so large as lake victoria although it is one of the largest lakes of the world it varies in size with the seasons during the floods it becomes an enormous lagoon almost as big as lake huron while in dry times it is as small as lake erie and looks more like a swamp than a lake leaving kuka we travel eastward through bornu to kano making our way with a party of traders from one place to another we have to go slowly marching along in single file for the roads are mere paths leading from village to village it takes quite a little army to carry our baggage we have not only food but also bales of clothes and bushels of cowrie shells with which to pay our expenses the traders have their money in slaves making each slave carry a load of goods on his head and selling both slave and goods at the villages on the way a good slave is worth one hundred and fifty thousand cowries and slaves have long been a common currency in this part of africa we do not believe in slave trading and therefore carry cloths and cowrie shells instead silver and gold coins are not known and the only money used for small change is these little shells which are brought by the shipload to africa from different parts of the indian ocean each shell is about as big as a lima bean and its value in some places is so small that it takes forty to be worth one of our cents and five dollars worth would fill a bushel basket such an amount of shells would be a load for two men and if all our money were carried that way we should not have enough to pay the wages of the porters by the time we reach kano therefore we use cloth one bale of which is worth many thousand shells we cut off a yard or so at each village and trade it for shells with which to buy what we want we also do much trading by barter exchanging what we have for the goods of the natives this way of doing business seems odd if we ask a man who has a sheep for sale what it is worth he may reply three yards of black stuff or six yards of white stuff or perhaps fifty glass beads or so many bars of salt according to what we have to offer most things are exchanged in this way and the people are so like children that a mechanical toy or a doll which cries would easily buy several parrots or monkeys we regret that we have not toys to take the place of the mass of cowrie shells we are carrying we move along carefully stopping at the villages every night and going nowhere alone after dark for fear of lions leopards and other wild beasts we keep together on the march lest we be captured by the slave traders and carried off to the wilder parts of the country and sold every now and then we see strange birds of beautiful plumage and butterflies and moths more gorgeous than any found in our land there are frogs in the swamps and tortoises and crocodiles in the rivers we are told to look out for snakes and especially for the little puff adder whose bite is death the insects of africa are quite as dangerous as the wild beasts we examine our toes every night to know whether we have been bitten by the jigger a little insect which burrows under one's toenails and there lays its eggs this is done so gently that one does not know it is until his toe begins to itch and then upon looking a black spot is seen just under the nail this contains the eggs in a little sack which may be taken out with a needle if it is left and the eggs hatch the insects create a festering sore which often causes the loss of a toe among the most interesting african insects are the ants which are to be found in almost all parts of the continent as we travel about we often go by mounds thirty 
or forty feet thick and from ten to fifteen feet high each mound is an ant hill the home of thousands of ants it is a network of tunnels galleries and chambers arranged in stories some of which are far below the level of the ground it might be called an ant apartment house the ants have a queen who is waited upon by the workers away down in the basement of such a house the queen lays all the eggs of the colony and her subjects take them as they are laid and carry them off to the nurseries to hatch them in some colonies there are soldier ants which guard the queen and the working ants labor under the soldiers among the most destructive of these insects are the white ants we soon learn about them for they have got into our baggage and eaten our lead pencils the corks from our bottles and all other things made of wood white ants will eat almost anything except iron or very hard wood they eat tables and chairs a man with a wooden leg would not dare to sleep in certain parts of africa for fear of finding his leg a heap of sawdust in the morning these ants burrow into the wood of houses they work in the dark and eat inside the posts and pillars until nothing is left of them but mere shells which finally give way and the whole house falls in going through the woods we are surprised to see but few dead trees upon the ground and very few branches we often pick up a stick to use as a cane and find that it breaks to pieces in our hands the ants have eaten out the inside of the stick and left only the shell they have eaten the dead trees and the shells have crumbled to dust such ants are bad enough but there are others much worse there are some whose bites sting like red-hot needles and others so ferocious that we can pull their bodies apart but their jaws still stick in our flesh we are warned against the terrible driver or soldier ant and give him a wide berth this ant does not weigh as much as the smallest pea but lions leopards and even elephants rush to get out of its way the driver ants move in vast numbers in regular order from place to place looking like a strip of black ribbon as they cross one's path if they meet anything living they throw themselves upon it and bite it to death they tear the flesh bit by bit from the bones and in a short time reduce it to a skeleton when they attack a hut not only the people but even the rats mice and insects run out for nothing living is willing to fight the terrible driver if they get upon us the best thing to do will be to rush for the nearest stream and dive in the ants do not like water and they will let go when it touches them. End of chapter 25